There are a few things that you must be good at before you can do calculus. A lot of guys like to rush and skip over all the stuff at the beginning. Those guys always end up falling short of the goal and quitting before we get what we want. That really ticks me off. Take your time in the beginning so you can stay up. To a challenge, that is, and finish what you started. To do calculus, you need a firm grasp on algebra. Some problems seem impossible until you use algebra to get everything in the right position. Then you can do it. If you're good, everything just slides into place. Check out our website if you need a refresher. You should remember this symbol, f of x. It means function. The x is a variable. Put it in and out comes the result. There are all kinds of functions. There are even some functions that take more than one variable. You won't see that in this video. To keep things straight, we use capital letters for functions and lowercase for variables. That's what I do, and I never have a problem keeping them straight. For calculus, a function must be contiguous over the span you are interested in. Contiguous means it doesn't suddenly stop. Have you ever just had that happen? There you are. Everything is going great. Then all of a sudden, everything stops. Oh, how annoying. I hate that. The good news is that for calculus, you can just skip those spots with interruptions and do it everywhere else. That's how to deal with points of discontinuity. The symbol for integration is? If you integrate, you get some. If we integrate f by x, we write it f dx. The dx means the difference of x. Integration is the opposite of differentiation. Integration is also useful for calculating distances. Going the distance is another type of sum. Differentiation uses the notation d over dx. It's the difference relative to the infinitely small difference of x. It's the trick to divide by zero. When we do sum functions, it can get messy with all those d over dx's. A little shorthand helps keep things clean. f prime. Use this as shorthand, but always keep it in mind which variable you are differentiating by. Once you have the prerequisites firmly in hand, we can focus on the meat of the subject. Let's start with something really easy. Like most guys. The constant rule is even easier than that. The derivative of a constant is zero. If c is a constant, then d over dx of c is equal to zero. No matter what you do, it just lays there. Zero rate of change. Isn't that always the case with the easy ones? Yeah. The reason nothing happens is there is no x. The difference of three per difference of x is zero. You have to have x to have a difference per x. That's sort of like TV. Try turning the intelligence up on TV. There just isn't a button for that. No matter what you do, it stays the same. Zero change. Exactly. Numerals like 3 69. or 7 are constants. But variables can also act like constants. Variables are constant? Okay. You better explain that for the guys that were paying attention to the wrong things. If you are differentiating on x, then all the variables that are x don't change. They're constant. For example, for 3y raised to the power 2, then d dx of the function is 0. c, no x. What about integrals? They're sums, so how does the rule apply? Yes, you can get sum without having x, but it's sort of boring. The integral of 1 dx is equal to x, and the integral of b dx is bx. We need to look at the power rule to understand why, so let's do that. Okay, let's. I have the power! Okay, cute outfit, mistress of the universe. But let's save that for later unless you're really into math. The power rule is the all-purpose, get-the-job-done rule of calculus. For most cases, you'll end up using the power rule at some point when you're doing it. What about forgetting sums? Yes, it works for integration, only in reverse. 
this is what the power rule looks like. d dx of x to the power n is equal to nx to the power of n minus 1. See, you have a function x to the power of n, which we all remember means you have x multiplied n times. d over dx, ax of n, is equal to n times a times x to the power n minus 1. And integration is the opposite of differentiation. So, let me guess. For integration, the rule is the integral x to the power of n dx equals x to the power of n plus 1 over n plus 1. That's it. Great, because it's so much more fun when I get it, too. Here's a quickie. If you multiply or divide a function by a constant, just calculate the derivative or the integral, then multiply it by the constant. That is a quickie. And it does it for all the functions. That's a quickie to remember. Now that you have the power rule, you can do functions with a single term. How do you do more than one? If we're talking about math, we do it like this f of x plus g of x, it's easy. Since they don't interact, keep it that way. Do each one separately. Uh, yes, this works for both integration and differentiation. How did you know that's what I was going to ask? Oh, something. d dx of f plus g is equal to df dx plus dg dx. The integral of f plus g dx is equal to the integral of f dx plus the integral of g dx. The addition rule works on separate terms, but what if you can't separate them? What if you have to do them together? This is sounding like something that should be on Jerry Springer. If you have two different functions multiplied by each other, you can't separate them. Sort of like frat boys and beer. Yeah, but they don't do anything useful when they get together. If you have a product of two functions, when you try something with one, the other is instantly affected. You can't keep them apart. They come together, so you have to do them differently. And how is that? Use the product rule. It's everything you need for this situation. This is what it looks like. ddx of f times g is equal to ddx of f times g plus f times ddx of g. In other words, do one, then flip them over, and then do the other, and the result is your answer. And everyone's happy. If you're doing products, then you need a way to do quotients. Of course. Let's say you have two functions of x, f of x and u of x. The formula to differentiate f over u is f over u is equal to df dx, u minus f du dx over u to the power 2. That looks a little like the product rule. Yes, it does. That is because multiplication and division are related. I still think it sounds like Jerry Springer. Does f over u happen very often? Well, it does happen. But I have the quotient rule, so I deal with it when it does. There's another rule that is related to the quotient rule. It is called the reciprocal rule. That sounds like a rule all the guys should learn. It is an important rule. There is a special case where the power rule doesn't quite work. If you have a function, f of x, the reciprocal is 1 over f. Oh, I thought you meant something else. The formula to find the derivative is 1 over f is equal to negative f prime over f to the power of 2. The 
power rule deals with x to the power of something. What about something to the power of x? In that position, x certainly has a lot of power. Absolutely. That is why we have a special rule for that. It's called the exponential rule because x is the exponent. a to the power of x is equal to a to the power of x times the natural log of a. <laughs> That's funny. It is? No, it's not. Can you guess our next rule? Hmm, you have wood and you're beating it. I give up, what is it? Logarithms! You stumped me. Do you remember logarithms? I do, because I always do the prerequisites. Of course, I think there are guys watching that skip the prerequisites. Good point. Logarithms are contiguous for non-zero positive values. That means they stop working if x is less than or equal to zero. I can relate to that. We can only differentiate logarithms for positive non-zero values of x. That's still a lot of x. The formula for the derivative is d dx of the log base a of the absolute value of x is equal to 1 over x multiplied by the natural log of a. I noticed that the derivative has a natural log. Viagra free. Explaining calculus for trigonometric functions requires that you understand calculus more fully. For now, just memorize this table. To help you memorize, use flashcards. Only one more rule to go. The chain rule. The chain rule is used for linking functions together. Like a chain. Your bikini is a perfect example of the chain rule. Chain mail is sorta of heavy. The more links, the heavier it is. The more area it covers, the more links. Area affects links, which affects weight. It works like a chain. If we have functions for each, we can use the chain rule to calculate the rate of change of weight relative to the area. Let's see if we can tie all this together with an example. Tie? What happened to the chains? What did I do to deserve this punishment? A equals area, L equals links, W equals weight. L equals three multiplied by A to the power three. W equals two multiplied by L. DW DA is equal to DW DL times DL DA. Let me see if I can do this. Go ahead, show us what you got. I thought that's what I was doing. Anyways, DL DA equals three times three times A to the power of two. DW DL equals two. So DW DA equals two times three times A to the power of two. Perfect, you have it covered. That's good because this bikini doesn't. Did you know that Isaac Newton, the guy that discovered calculus, died a virgin? That seems to be a tradition for mathematicians. How do you like them apples?